Hi, everyone. If you're just joining us, welcome to Data Edge 2020. I'm Mike Rivera. I use he, him pronouns, and I'll be your host for the track two stage. Um, go ahead and please use, I'm not sure which side of the screen it's on, uh, but go ahead and use the stage chat feature to share any questions you have throughout the talk. And at the end of the talk during Q&A, we'll get to as many of those as we possibly can. Uh, in a few short moments, we're going to hear from the amazing Samir uh, Srivastava. Uh, Samir is an associate professor and Harold First Chair in Management, Philosophy, and Values at our very own Haas School of Business here at UC Berkeley. And he will be talking to us today about applying deep learning to identify visionary ideas from the language used by individuals and groups. Please help me uh, welcome Samir in the chat. Um, and again, just as a reminder throughout the talk, as you think of questions, please post them in the chat and we'll get to some of those um, at, at the end. Um, hi, Samir, thank you for joining us today. Um, and the floor is now yours, thanks. Thank you so much, Mike, for that kind introduction. Thank you all for joining uh, this session. And um, as Mike mentioned, the topic of today's talk is about a subject that many people discuss. We hear about it in the realm of politics. We hear about it in the realm of business. It's this idea of vision. And um, while it is uh, a much talked about topic, it is also a somewhat abstract idea and one that is not very easy to get one's arms around empirically. So um, as Mike alluded to, what I want to describe to you is a project where we uh, begin to try to measure and quantify vision just based on everyday language. And in doing so, we're going to engage with a puzzle in the academic literature about where visionary ideas emanate from. So if we look at uh, prior work on the topic of vision, uh, probably the most prominent strand of research really focuses on individual visionaries, whether it's Steve Jobs or Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Vincent Van Gogh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, there are several either biographies or studies of the personal qualities that lead uh, certain individuals to become visionary or not, what happens in their childhoods, what are the experiences that they have that are really formative. And that's a, uh, a rich tradition of uh, scholarly work. Um, the other uh, dominant approach is to look at the tangible manifestations of vision. So we could think about novel technologies or products. We could think about books and articles and the impact that they have. We could think about um, really breakthrough patents and the extent to which they're cited by others. Uh, so these are the two uh, prominent ways that we've seen for really studying vision, either studying the individuals or studying uh, the products that they produce. But vision itself, the actual quality of coming up with a visionary idea, is really uh, difficult to, to directly observe. We can see how it might manifest, but we can't often actually see it. Um, and we might see a visionary person, but um, it's unclear whether they were the person who actually came up with the visionary idea or the person who gets credit as we go back in time and, and think about the history of uh, where ideas came from. And so if we then think about, uh, again, pri prior research and the existing literature, um, we can also think about the origins of vision, not in the form of individuals, but in the form of social positions. That is, we can take a structural lens into thinking about where vision comes from. And if we think about this from a more structural, more sociological point of view, um, it, might, uh, it leads us to these competing expectations about which positions uh, in society will lead to a vision advantage. And broadly speaking, there are lots of ways of characterizing uh, social positions, but one prominent way is to think about uh, who is in the center, what is in the center of a field, and uh, who or what are on the periphery of the field. Um, and the central actors who are often the larger, more established ones, if we think about this in network analytic terms, they're the ones uh, through which many of the uh, connections flow. Uh, these individuals and these organizations and these actors more, more generally um, are more likely to have resources. And if you have more resources or higher quality resources, it ought to make it easier to forecast and plan for how the world is going to evolve. Um, central actors also have power. And so 
there's a, an ability of central actors to influence uh, smaller firms or smaller actors to, uh, to, to follow suit when they take uh, some initiative. And they also have status or prestige, which makes them um, the types of actors that others want to emulate. So there's one set of reasons that might favor uh, the idea that vision will come from these more central players. But you can also imagine a countervailing set of forces that favor the periphery. So for example, uh, the central actors are also really invested in the status quo. Uh, peripheral actors have stronger incentives because they're on the periphery to imagine a different world in which uh, they might gain more advantage. Um, they're also arguably less constrained by received wisdom. They're uh, less subject to institutional and normative constraints in the way that central actors might be. And so this is uh, the, the kind of core question we want to get at in this project. Now, the ambiguity about which structural positions might lead to a vision advantage arises in part, we argue, uh, because of a methodological gap. And that's because uh, the ways in which we try to indirectly get at uh, where, where does vision come from or what is vision is either by looking at novelty. Um, so something new might be uh, thought of as visionary, but if we think about it a little bit more deeply, we'd see that there are many, many forms of novelty that die on the vine. Um, and uh, novelty by itself doesn't necessarily guarantee that an idea is gonna be visionary in the way that we typically think about it. And the other way uh, that we tended to study about study vision is again, indirectly through tangible invention. So again, here, think about papers or patents, and there's a large, uh, you know, robust industry that's looked at citation patterns, right? And, and uh, the impact of a tangible invention on the world. Um, but we know that there are many inventions that don't actually turn into a paper or don't turn into a discrete uh, patent uh, that we can trace the impact of. So we're likely missing out on a lot of um, visionary ideas if we restrict ourselves just to tangible inventions. And so the idea in this paper, um, and I should mention my co-authors here, Amir Goldberg and Paul Vishnanza, were both at uh, Stanford Graduate School of Business. Um, what the three of us look at in this uh, project and the, and the claim we make is that the everyday language that actors can use uh, can reveal the extent to which they are visionary. And now is a good time for us to uh, spell out what we mean when we say visionary ideas, how we define vision. And there are really two components to our definition. One is that a visionary idea rethinks the fundamental logic of action in a field. And the other is it's a, it's a rethinking that is prescient. That is, it foresees how the future is going to evolve. So a, a nice illustration of this is um, uh, based on the book Moneyball, um, which got, of course, turned into a, a popular movie. And this is, of course, about the use of data analytics in uh, sports, particularly in this case, baseball, and how uh, through the use of data analytics, the Oakland Athletics, the team in question here, uh, was able to compete at a very high level, even with a much limited uh, budget for recruiting talent and for developing talent. And uh, that idea, uh, we're gonna uh, find undervalued assets, human assets, and invest in those undervalued assets, then actually took over not only the world of baseball, but arguably a lot of sports. So that's an example in our mind of a visionary idea. And um, you couldn't necessarily trace this back to a one particular paper or one particular patent. It was a set of ideas, but that set of ideas fundamentally transformed the way that um, people go about actually sourcing talent, developing talent and so on, and now it's become commonplace. So that's the kind of idea that we want to try to search for uh, in language. And the claim again is that we can find traces of vision, not maybe the full statement of what exactly Moneyball is in a given document, but the ways in which people start talking about things like um, uh, recruiting and scouting begin to shift in subtle ways. And those subtle shifts might be indicative of vision uh, being expressed. So how are we gonna do this? We're gonna use a 
technique, a deep learning technique, a model referred to as BERT, which is a generalized uh, language model that's gonna learn uh, syntax and semantics using a masked prediction task. So the idea is it's gonna predict hidden words based on neighboring words in a sentence. It's going to uh, give greater weight to certain words, which will allow full sentence propagation. Um, for those of you who are familiar with BERT, you know that it was developed uh, by Google and, and initially trained there. Um, but now uh, one can apply it and fine tune it to a specific corpus. It is a, as I mentioned, deep learning model with uh, a, a very large number of parameters. And so the basic intuition is we're gonna take a sentence, Bert's gonna take a sentence like, earnings are up this quarter. It's going to hide one of the words from itself, like the word up, and then it's going to try to guess what that word is based on the surrounding words. And then based on whether the guess is right or not, it's gonna continue to update until it uh, you know, begins to learn what those missing words ought to be. So using that task, and I won't go through more of the details of it, we can uh, get an estimate of how unexpected, how surprising a given word is to the model. And that can be expressed as uh, this term perplexity. And then we can uh, start to take the product of word perplexities in a sentence and get a sentence level per perplexity measure. And we can think about this as a sort of contextual novelty measure. So this is not just, this is a new word that's not been used, but we're starting to like use words in new ways that have not been used before. They, the, the overall meanings of these words are gonna start to shift and we can start to detect that. Now that's still only a measure of novelty. Uh, we haven't yet gotten to vision. But this is a key building block to getting to uh, our measure of vision. So what is vision then? Well, we define vision uh, based on changes in perplexity over time. So we think about um, the intuition of the, of, the, of the measure is that we're going to find words or ways of speaking in a given time period that are very surprising to the model, that are very unexpected. But then if we look in the future, um, that way of speaking becomes really commonplace. And if that's the case, then we can infer that uh, this set of ideas became, became uh, the standard. Notice here, this measure does not tell us uh, anything about the mechanism by which an idea becomes a visionary idea. It could be, for example, that the person uttering the idea is then going to go out and influence other people to follow. It could be that this person is just good at forecasting. It could be that uh, the person comes up with something and others are just inclined to, to follow without any like formal influence uh, step. Uh, we're agnostic about the mechanism at this point. We're just trying to find, uh, you know, where do these vision, visionary ideas come from? Okay, so we take this basic uh, apparatus and we apply it to three different domains. Uh, three very different domains. So the first is the world of politics. And here we're going to take uh, the speeches given by um, US senators and members of the House of Representatives on the floors of their respective chambers uh, over uh, 1961 to 2017. In the world of uh, law, we're going to look at the US federal and state court rulings over a 50 year period. Uh, in the world of business, we have a, a smaller corpus. Um, this is from uh, the Seeking Alpha platform, but it's about 10 years of quarterly earnings call transcripts. So these are the calls that uh, the management team of all publicly traded firms hold with the analysts who cover their stocks. And uh, we have uh, all of those transcripts over, over that 10-year ten, ten period. So let me again uh, just explain the procedure here just in a bit more detail. Here we're going to take a representative sentence uh, coming out of our business corpus. So we're shutting down a facility and starting a platform. So we're going to tokenize the sentence step one. Then we're going to load these masked uh, language models uh, for multiple time periods. Um, then we're, so in this case, 2011, 2016, trying to see the extent to which language used in 2011 is visionary when we consider uh, the world five years in the future. Um, we're going to get perplexities of each word uh, for both of these. Uh, from both of these models, we're going to then get the perplexities for the entire sentence uh, by multiplying the word level perplexities 
and then we're going to compute the prescience or vision of that sentence, uh, looking at the change in perplexities over that time period. That's the, the basic intuition of what we're doing. And when we apply this model across the domains, we start at the word level, just to, at the simplest level, starting to see uh, some patterns that sort of make sense. So in the world of politics, um, you know, for this time period, among the least prescient words are, for example, Soviets. Among the most prescient, prescient are Russian, uh, foreshadowing the change uh, that happened in the USSR. And you can see similar changes in the world of law. The one example I want to just take a moment to talk about, because we uh, it, we saw this and, and started to puzzle over it, uh, is the word onboard. And as we dug into this some more, what we realized is that the word onboard really shifts in meaning over the time horizon uh, that we studied. So prior to the development of software as a service, as a business model, onboarding was primarily used as a human resources term. So uh, really referring to newcomer socialization. So we hire a new person, we have to onboard them into the company. That means getting them set up with their laptops and giving them uh, all of the training on our values and things like that. In the world of software as a service, onboard takes on a new meaning. Now all of a sudden it refers to bringing new customers onto a platform. And so the, the firms that are using onboard early on are starting at, and, and in this novel way are the ones that are anticipating the rise of software as a service as a business model. And that's part of why the model picks, uh, picks them up as being uh, prescient or visionary um, at that time. Okay, so what we find, uh, and this is of course not uh, causal, but we start to see here uh, that uh, this measure of vision is positively related at least uh, correlated, at least, with success uh, in, in the ways that you might expect in each of these three domains. So, for example, uh, in the world of politics, uh, the uh, politician's likelihood of getting reelected uh, or the likelihood that he or she will serve on a high-status committee, where committee status is a function of the vacancy chains that happen when one senator or representative resigns and new people get reshuffled from, from that reshuffling, we can infer which are the higher status committees and we can see that uh, the, the more visionary politicians are more likely to get assigned to those, uh, those committees. Similarly, in the domain of law, uh, we see a, a positive relationship between vision and uh, just raw citation counts, but also the likelihood of a landmark ruling where you could think about a landmark ruling as one which is in the top 5% of um, highest cited Supreme Court decisions. Um, and then in the world of business, we see a relationship between um, vision and uh, annualized uh, stock returns over a three year period. And if we unpack that and we look at, uh, you know, which firms are getting the most uh, bang for the buck from being visionary or the highest returns, we see that it's the ones that are at the really upper end of that distribution. So the 95th to 100th percentile are the ones where we see uh, especially high returns. Um, you know, they, they sort of stand out from the pack. So then we start to investigate uh, what kinds of actors are more likely to um, become high in vision or high according to visionary according to this measure. Um, so here, visionaries is especially high on this continuous measure. And uh, in the world of politics, we can think about uh, the legislative network as defined by bill co-sponsorship. So when a bill gets introduced in the House or the Senate, then uh, the, the initiating uh, politician can encourage other politicians to sign on to that bill. And so from that, we can start to then, based on who signs on with whom, uh, derive the network of bill co-sponsorships, and then we can measure centrality in that network using standard uh, like eigenvector centrality measure. And what we see here is that uh, the more central an actor, uh, the less likely they are to be especially visionary. And we see a similar pattern in the world of uh, the courts and, and the law. Um, so uh, here we can think about centrality or periphery on the basis of uh, uh, sort of you know, where a court ranks. So you have the state appeals court, the state Supreme Court, 
Uh, those went to the state courts, then you have the U.S. District Courts, the U.S. Appeals Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court. And you see, essentially, um, that the closer we get to the center, where you could argue the Supreme Court is, is really at the center, um, the likelihood of being truly visionary goes down, right? And so this is perhaps counterintuitive. We might think that the Supreme Court is the most influential, and of course it is. However, the ideas that are uh, put forward in, in Supreme Court arguments are often arg arguments and ideas that may have originated uh, elsewhere and often at the state level, and they kind of bubble up uh, more uh, to the Supreme Court level. And, and we see evidence of that here uh, with this result. And then finally, in the realm of business, uh, our measure here is a, admittedly a little bit more crude. It's just looking at size, but it's another way of thinking about which firms are more central versus more on the periphery. And uh, whether we look at, in this case, assets or employees, other ways of looking at size, size is negatively related to vision. So I'm uh, just about here, uh, wrap, wrapping up here, and I'll then turn, turn, open it up for questions. But I think what we're trying to uh, suggest here is that these deep learning techniques, which have really uh, proliferated in recent years, uh, you know, we think can be used to detect traces of vision. I'm not suggesting that uh, the model is going to pick out a sentence and say, this is the statement of vision. But it's the beginning to communicate in these idiosyncratic, unusual ways that are, are predictive of how the world is going to evolve. That we think the model does pick up on. And that vision is different from just novelty or uh, inventions that get cited, right? It's, it's really about reconceptualizing the field, uh, the entire field, uh, like sabermetrics kind of way, uh, in, in ways that then become uh, taken for granted. Um, as we see, there is at least a tendency for um, the visionary actors to be rewarded. We see that in all, all three domains in the world of business. We see that it's really the truly uh, highly visionary actors that seem to get uh, most of the, of the rewards. And then across all three fields, we see that vision emerges from the periphery rather than from the core. Um, so I want to stop there. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this is collaborative work with my uh, friend and, and colleague, Amir Goldberg, at Stanford Business School. We jointly co-direct the Computational Culture Lab, which stands Berkeley and Stanford. Um, and uh, Paul Mutinanza, the third author, is uh, a PhD student in our, in our lab. Uh, and you can learn more about our research uh, at the website listed below. So let me stop there. Mike, um, let me uh, turn it over to you for questions that may have come up. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Samir. Thanks for sharing a little bit of what you and your team are, are doing. Um, we have uh, just under 10 minutes uh, to engage a couple questions from all of y'all. Uh, so first, I would like to raise up the question from Sahab, and I believe the tech team will uh, show that question on the screen. Thanks. Awesome, thank you. Great, is there a connection between um, with being visionary and persistence or grit? It's a great question, Sahab. Um, they're very well maybe. In our data, I don't know how we would measure persistence or grit. Um, all that this model is picking up on is these you know, unusual ways of speaking that are surprising in that moment, but that become commonplace later. As I mentioned, one of the limitations of this measurement approach is the mechanisms by which these ideas become visionary uh, are not super clear. So is it a function of the actor? Is it a function of others following the actor? Some combination of both? Um, that is, is a really important uh, uh, question, which this method doesn't really help us get at. We'd have to supplement this with other methods to, to get to. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from yours truly, and then we'll go back into the comments. Sure. So I'll wait, I'll wait for uh, them to post it and then I'll, I'll read out loud. Oh, okay, let's go with, let's go with Spencer's question first and then we'll, we'll come back to mine. Um, so um, I'll read out loud. Uh, do the positive relationships between vision and success hold when additional covariates are considered? For example, my naive expectation would be that high quality committee assignments would be highly correlated with the number of terms served in Congress. Great question, Spencer. And yes, I showed you uh, essentially the results of marginal effects plots from a regression model that includes a bunch of other controls. Um, so you're absolutely right that um, 
tenure in the Senate or the House is a very strong correlate of uh, committee prestige, uh, just because um, people kind of move up the status ordering all else equal over time. So these analyses do account for uh, some of the some of the more obvious types of control that you want, you want to take into account. I want to be careful, though, that I'm not making here a causal claim about vision and success, um, because uh, this research design doesn't allow us to really pin down that causal effect. It's really more of an association or correlation uh, that we would need to, to flesh out further to know if it's a causal relationship. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll just ask mine live because I'm Go for it. having some copy and paste issues. So I'm wondering if you could talk about whether this insight could help us identify vision in real time yeah. versus if this happens primarily retrospectively. Yeah, so that's said a... differently. Could you say these ideas will be visionary versus these ideas were visionary? Yeah. So if I could do that, Mike, what I would do <laughs> tomorrow is go and find- I want to join firm. you. I want to join you too. Yeah, find the <laughs> firms that are going to be visionary 10 years from now and start uh, buying up shares, right? Um, unfortunately, this method is really a retrospective method, right? So we can, we can go back in time and find unusual places where uh, novel ideas first percolated. And actually, one of the things that I think this could be used for is, uh, you know, we, in, if we go back in time and we give credit to different people or firms or uh, individuals for, for being the visionary, uh, the visionaries who came up with an idea, but they could be just the ones who popularized an idea. And so a method like this, I think, can more readily identify the unsung heroes in history. That's one way this could be used, but um, at least the approach we've taken right now doesn't allow us to, uh, to, to make predictions about who's going to become visionary. That could be also an interesting thing to, to go back in time and see if we can have a classifier that begins to predict, you know, the, the properties uh, that lead certain individuals or firms to, uh, you know, exhibit high levels of prescience, um, and then see if that's predicted. But that's not what we do in this particular project. Absolutely, and not to push too much on this point, but it seems from the chat that there's a lot of excitement on this kind of line of thought. So I wonder if, if the tech team could raise up Anil's question. Um, it's related, but maybe you could just talk a little bit more. Yeah, uh, so at the moment, Anil, I mean, this is, uh, we view this as a, as a first step. And so it's basically trying to demonstrate that, you know, we think that this approach can help find uh, visionary ideas. And I, just as I was saying a minute ago, I think a, a next step, if, if, we, if we believe that this is working in the way we expect it to, and we can validate that it's producing visionary ideas, then the next question is, to what extent can we predict? And to what extent can predictions trained on historical data still make valid predictions today. And I think in the world of vision, as opposed to other things we might be trying to forecast, I think it's a little bit harder to know whether even the models trained on the past are gonna work in the future. So that's uh, a really good question. And I don't have, unfortunately, a more satisfying answer at the moment. Awesome, thanks. And I think if the tech team will allow, we have time to squeeze one more question there. Uh, there's a lot of excitement. Um, um, I don't think that was, oh, I think this particular individual uh, posted multiple questions. I was thinking the one about the, the crypto. There we go. There we go. Let's engage crypto for a little bit. Oh, uh, great question. And uh, unfortunately, our um, we, we sort of concluded our analysis on the um, business data set in 2016. So, we, you know, we, we could, we had not yet done it, is to just extend the analysis up to today. We'd have to go back and do some processing of the data. And, and so we just haven't gotten around to that, but I, it wouldn't be hard to take the same apparatus and, um, and apply it uh, to the world of crypto. Absolutely. Awesome. Another one oh, from and Sahab. Can I take, oh. Yeah, can I take Sahab? Yeah. That's yeah. A, another terrific question. And Sahab, the, the short answer is for this initial paper, this initial project, we made some assumptions about what's the right time horizon, right? So in the world of business, we picked five years. But um, I think it's a really, a really profound question of how the time horizon for vision to be realized varies across domains. And, um, and, and you know, again, right now we're, in this project, we were just uh, making some rough cut assumptions about how the world of politics differs from the world of law. But um, I think over time, it would be really nice to be able to get more systematic about that than we have thus far. 
Awesome. Well, that brings us to the end of um, this particular segment. Thank you again very much, Samir. I welcome other folks to, to give them the applause in the comments. Um, we appreciate your time and what great work you and your team are doing. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. Thanks everyone for the really helpful comments and feedback. Awesome. Thank you. Um, now, before our next speaker, we're going to have a little bit of time for you all to connect with each other, kind of as if we were in person. I know we will eventually get there one day, but we're going to try to mimic that as much as possible. So um, on the left of your screen, you'll see a networking tab. And here you'll be uh, you'll wait to be matched with another attendee. Um, and you could talk and network with them for about three minutes. Um, and then you will cycle through uh, uh, kind of a pairing with other attendees. And if you're interested in, in kind of a group networking with our colleagues over at Wells Fargo, uh, we invite you to head over to the lounges where you could join the Connection Lounge. Our break uh, for networking is about 20 minutes. And so once 20 minutes are over, um, then you could come back to the stages, select which track you would like to view. Um, and as always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them um, in the event chat. We hope to see you back in this track, uh, but if not, we hope you have a, a wonderful time uh, during the rest of Data Edge. Uh, thank you very much and happy networking. Peace. Awesome, welcome back everyone. I hope you were able to connect with one with one another during the networking break. And thanks to the tech team for the awesome jams. Up here on track two, next we have our very own iSchool PhD alum, Doris Lee. Doris is the co-founder and CEO of Ponder. Ponder makes it easy to use, enterprise ready tool that supports rapid experimentation with data at scale. It's centered around making pandas more scalable. Today, Doris will be presenting their easy to use, enterprise ready tools that support rapid experimentation with data at scale. Please help me welcome Doris in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, thanks again to the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak at Data Edge today. Uh, today I'll be sharing uh, some of the work that we're doing at Ponder, which is a data science uh, tooling startup, uh, a startup that's spin off of UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, at a very high level, our mission at Ponder is to address some of the pain points around working with pandas, which is one of the most uh, important libraries in data science. And as a brief background to myself, um, I recently finished my PhD at the Berkeley iSchool, where I worked on building tools that makes it easier for people to visualize and explore their data. Um, and my research sort of sat at this intersection between uh, visualizations, uh, human computer interaction, and uh, data management. And in particular, I applied a lot of um, human-centered design principles in, in thinking holistically about uh, how to design uh, better data science tooling and system. And I'm now continuing some of this work as part of uh, a company called Ponder, where we're building easy to use enterprise ready tools that supports um, uh, working with pandas and scalable experimentation with data at scale. So, Let's get started. Uh, so many of you have probably heard of or have used uh, the pandas data frame in, in your uh, data science work. And for those of you who aren't familiar with pandas, pandas is actually one of the most uh, popular data science tools that we have today. Um, it's this really awesome data analysis library uh, for Python that comes with a rich set of functionalities uh, with, uh, and that includes letting users uh, play with their data and, and then getting quick feedback. Um, and it allows you to do anything from data cleaning, data analysis, uh, pre-processing your data, uh, feature engineering, and so on. So all of this is super helpful when you're either building a machine learning model or want to run some statistics or do, do analysis on your data. And so taking a step back, what we're doing at Ponder is, uh, is really trying to improve this, this um, experience in working with the Pandas uh, library. And uh, our mission at Ponder is around the idea that uh, we want to improve the data scientist experience in working with the Pandas data frame. And Lux uh, is one of the tools that we've developed here. Um, and, and this goes back to some of the research that I did at UC Berkeley, which which is around uh, providing automatic visualizations uh, to a Pandas data frame. And so this is the first project that we're going to dive in and, and, and talk a little bit more about. Um, and so at a, at a high level, uh, what we're doing um, is uh, 
a lot of the times when people are exploring their data with pandas, it looks like something that you see on the left hand side here where you're in a Jupyter notebook environment, uh, you want to explore your data and um, plot some visualizations and ask questions about your data um, and, and trying to learn some insights that inform the next step in your analysis. And this is typically done by writing pandas code uh, and in your Jupyter notebook uh, to, to iterate on your data. But the trouble is that the pandas data frame supports a wide range of functionality. And so it's up to the data analyst or the data scientist to pick what needs to be done to your data to figure out uh, uh, to figure out the next steps in your analysis. And so for starters, you might have to ask question about, you know, what portions of the data I should look at, um, what data transformations do I have to apply? And then after all of that data processing, you need to figure out, you know, how, how do I want to visualize and, and look at my data? So it's a lot of, it ends up being a lot of code and a lot of decisions being made in the process. And so what we've done with a, a tool, an open source tool that we've developed called Lux is um, we are providing an easy way for you to visualize your data frame. So typically in the notebook context, when you're printing out your data frame, all you, all you kind of see is what you see on the, the right hand side here, which is just rows and columns of your data. Um, and, and that can tell you what the data looks like, but it's often uh, not very visual. So you can't, you can't see what's going on. And so with Lux, whenever you uh, print out your data frame, you not only get this table that we see here, but when you click on this toggle button, what you also see is a dashboard of visualizations that are automatically recommended to you. And you can interact with this dashboard. And what we're essentially doing is picking out the most interesting and relevant insights uh, as you're going through your analysis and exploring your data. And um, we think that the visual view and the, uh, the data frame view is a very complementary view that gives you not only the structural and schema information about your data, but also the, the visual um, and visual insights. And so that's a very quick overview of uh, the, the Lux project, which has gotten a lot of open source adoption um, by, by data scientists across uh, various, um, various industries. And um, the second project I'm going to be talking about is a, a project called Modin. And Modin is focused on this aspect of uh, being able to automatically scale up uh, your data frame and solving the scalability challenge that we often see when users are working with the Pandas data frame. And so to kind of explain what I mean by scalability challenges with Pandas, uh, one of the very core challenges that we see when, when working with uh, the Pandas data frames is that it often breaks down on large data sets. Um, and the reason that's the case is that Pandas itself is single threaded. Um, it's and it can get really slow when you're operating on large data sets. What's worse is that um, you can only work with the data that fits into your memory. And so once you exceed that, or when you're close to that limit, you can very easily run into out of memory issues. And so what that ends up looking like is users end up having to operate on a sample of the data um, or prototype with a sample of your data. Uh, and then rewriting it uh, for more scalable use cases or when they're putting things into production. So this rewriting process is, uh, is super costly uh, in terms of the engineering hours that are spent, uh, but it also makes it super difficult to debug and experiment with um, iterating on your data and, uh, and your pandas uh, workloads. And also it results in a lot of developer frustration and uh, loss of productivity. And so this is a very common challenge that we see uh, with uh, people using uh, pandas on large data sets. So um, to address this issue of panda scalability, we've been working on an open source project called Modin. And Modin is essentially a drop-in replacement for pandas. Um, and what this looks like is all you have to do is change the single line of import and boom, all of a sudden you get a uh, much better performance uh, on the same code that you you had originally, um, and so you can. What that means is that you can continue to use your familiar pandas API. Uh, in this case, the read CSVs, the means, the group buys, all the all the APIs that you're familiar with, but you're getting um, a, a significant speed up uh, because all the operations are run in parallel. So with Modin, uh, you no longer have to 
switch to a new framework or, uh, or learn a different language uh, or become an expert in distributed computing to be able to scale up to these workloads. Um, and we've seen an incredible amount of traction and adoption also for the tool Modin. Um, today, it has more than 3 million downloads, more than 100 uh, uh, contributors, and um, it's used by many uh, companies, including um, including Fortune 100 companies uh, in, 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 and their data science teams. Um, so we're, we're very excited to, to kind of continue uh, the growth of this uh, open source project at Ponder. And I wanted to dive into a more concrete use case um, of, of what using Modin would look like. And so here what I'm showing is, is a quick demo on the New York taxi data set. So let's say that I'm a data scientist and I'm trying to build a model around uh, taxi time prediction. So I want to um, predict the arrival time for, for, for taxis in New York City. And I want to work with this data set that's two gigabytes sitting on my laptop. And so as I'm going through this exercise, I first need to read in my CSV file. So I, I call the function uh, read CSV, I, I run some operations. Um, and, and so what I'm showing here is the exact same script uh, written in Modin and in Pandas. And you'll notice if, if you uh, really zoom in the code, there's no difference other than the line of import at the very top. Um, and so let's run these two, uh, these three, uh, these three commands uh, in uh, simultaneously. So this is a video that I recorded, and then let's see how long it takes. So with Modin, you could see that the job gets completed very quickly, whereas it, with pandas, there's a bit of a slowdown. Um, and so that's a side by side comparison uh, on the interactive performance of Modin versus pandas. If you actually want to stare at the numbers, you break it down to uh, the, read C the, the performance of the read CSV command, the is null command, and the apply map command. And we can see here that uh, the um, that Modin is giving us uh, uh, many um, many times uh, performance speed up and improvement compared to using pandas. And so it's really aimed at giving developers this interactive experience so that they can iterate on their data faster with pandas without having to worry about a different language or a different framework. So uh, I talked, I showed kind of a demo and, and talked a little bit about uh, how Modin, uh, what, what Modin is doing and, and um, what is the benefits that it delivers. Uh, so I wanted to kind of delve, delve deeper and explain like, what's the magic here? Like, why is Modin able to run much faster than compared to uh, Pandas? And so as we saw earlier, Pandas is single threaded, which means that even if you had more cores in your machine, you wouldn't be able to fully utilize this resource. So all the red stuff is, is essentially wasted resource. Throwing more compute at it doesn't equal faster run times. And so on the other hand, Modin uses all your cores, which means that all of the, the compute that are on your are on your machine, it fully utilizes all the CPUs and, and Modin is able to use all of the cores to speed up your pandas workload. And in fact, we uh, if you throw more more cores and more compute at uh, at Modin, especially on very large data sets that can't even be processed by pandas. Um, we, we find that Modin's performance improves. Um, and uh, in, in one of our most recent papers, we've actually ran some benchmarks comparing Modin with respect to Pandas and other parallel data frame implementation. And, and we can see that as we throw more CPUs and throw more cores at Modin, um, Modin's improvement uh, increase, uh, uh, leads to order of magnitude um, levels of speed up uh, across a variety of uh, pandas functions from read CSV, fill in a count, uh, group by, and so on. And so, uh, uh, as I mentioned, Ponder, uh, as part of Ponder, we're, we're continuing to grow the adoption of these two open source projects, uh, Modin and Lux. Um, the, the two open source project is currently being used by more than 10% of Fortune 100 companies. Uh, we're seeing a, an incredible attraction uh, in the open source space. And um, with that, uh, I wanted to kind of summarize and, and, and again, talk about how um, our mission at Ponder is really around empowering data scientists to get 
to insights faster with the tools that they're already familiar with, and namely um, in improving the experience and using pandas. We saw how with the two projects, Lux and Modin, uh, data scientists don't have to change a single line of uh, what they're doing in, in order to supercharge uh, their pandas data frame and be able to get the benefits of automatic visualization and automatic um, scalability. And, and as a final note, um, we're, we're looking to work with uh, data scientists and uh, people who are interested in working with pandas. Um, and if, if you're running into some of these uh, challenges that I talked about earlier, or you're interested in trying out this tool, we're, we're super interested in, uh, in, in talking and, and learning uh, ways that we can help. Uh, so you can contact me um, at doris at ponder.io, or you can follow us at, at ponderdata um, on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you have. Thank you so much. Awesome, thanks Doris. Uh, we're going to first engage uh, a question to, to find out a little bit more about the origin of uh, the name for, for Modin. So uh, tech team will put uh, it up and then I'd love to get your, your, your thoughts on this. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. So we should be able to see the question uh, just below our videos. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about where the name Modin comes from. Yeah, uh, so Modin is actually a project that started by um, our, our uh, the Ponder CTO, uh, Devin Peterson, who's also uh, my colleague at UC Berkeley and colleague now at Ponder. Um, and uh, Modin is actually, the I think, the word in Korean for all. Um, and the idea is that, uh, the, the concept behind Modin is that we want to empower data scientists and all, like everyone, to be able to uh, work with large data sets. And it was, it's really a, around this idea of um, giving this uh, superpower, this ability to, to to everyone or to all. Awesome, thank you. Uh, next question: uh, Does Modin increase the speed by only utilizing parallel parallelization on a single machine, or can it be applied across multiple machines? And you might have touched this a little bit, but maybe you could spend a little bit more time mm -hmm. talking about it. Yeah, uh, this is a great question. Um, in in the slide deck that I showed, uh, I think I only showed the single. Um, machine example where if you throw more CPUs at it, um, then then we're able to uh, parallelize across the different cores. Um, this this applies also to the cluster settings. So if you have, um, you know, a array or a DAS cluster that is running, um, Modin is able to leverage those resources. So you, you should be able to run this on uh, AWS or any of the clusters that you have set up and leverage that level of parallelism. Awesome, thank you. So you definitely highlighted some of the areas where uh, kind of Modin works particularly well. And so there's a question from someone in the chat. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the aspects or functions or use cases that maybe Modin is a little bit less efficient or weakened. Thanks. Yeah, um, I mean, Modin is really designed to succeed in the large data use cases. Um, and so if you are working with like small data, data that you know, fits very well in memory and is running uh, pretty fast in uh, pandas, then in those cases, it wouldn't make sense to like switch to Modin uh, because Modin um, tries to parallelize things. And so sometimes that can introduce some uh, overheads uh, to, to the issue. So it's really aimed at those larger use cases, uh, at maybe at the gigabyte uh, or a couple hundred megabytes to gigabytes level uh, of data. Awesome, thank you. And I think we have a couple extra, uh, a little bit of time for uh, a few more questions. Um, would a mode and day frame be fully compatible uh, with scikit-learn and other uh, other uh, other things? Yeah, this is a great question because one of the uh, prime use cases for. Uh, both Modin and Pandas uh, and working with data frames is this uh, feature engineering uh, data processing step right before you you feed it into a machine learning model, right? So how does Modin uh, integrate well with um, with some of the downstream machine learning libraries? So Modin currently supports uh, some level of uh, integration with the popular tools in the PyData ecosystem. Um, and Scikit-learn itself uh, for some functionality takes in a data frame. And in those situations, Modin is, is interoperable with, with uh, scikit-learn. Um, and in cases where uh, it's an array, then, then some conversion is needed uh, to, to, to work with scikit-learn. Uh, Modin also uh, works really well for 
uh, for with XGBoost. So we have some tutorials and examples on our documentation page if you're interested in integration with XGBoost. Awesome, thanks. Then we have two questions that are related. I don't know if we could show both of them at once, but let's first yeah. engage this one. The second one's also to compare and contrast. So maybe first we uh -huh. can engage how is Modin compared to other platforms like Databricks? Yeah, I, I, that's a really great question. Our, our focus around like data, uh, our focus around like Modin is really around supporting the use case in, in Pandas and allowing uh, existing Pandas users or people who are using Pandas to be able to um, scale up to these larger use cases. And um, in the case of Databricks, uh, we've actually talked to a lot of Spark users uh, in the past and um, it, it takes a lot of work to, to be able to translate your Pandas workload into Spark or PySpark. Uh, and that introduces a lot of bottleneck in the process. Uh, people have also usually done this with SQL. So translating your prototype uh, up to a production use case in, in Spark or SQL. Uh, and so that's really the main difference is Modin is trying to solve that bottleneck and, and making the um, experience from prototyping to production as seamless as possible. Awesome, thanks. And just to, uh, actually, let's go to the next one just to kind of keep the, the Spark uh, kind of yeah. conversation going. Um, so it'll post up in just a second. Um, this is a question from Spencer. I guess I could just read out loud. Um, yeah, when would Modin uh, be used versus Spark? Could it replace Spark in a, company, a company's data science tech stack? Yeah, so uh, going back to what uh, the, the earlier question, I think I pointed out uh, this a, a bit earlier is uh, Modin isn't intended to be a replacement of Spark. I think they serve pretty different use cases. I mean, um, Spark is is great for these ETL use cases, uh, handling large scale data processing. Um, but we see a lot of uh, uh, we see a lot of use cases where people have these pandas workflow and they want to be able to scale up to larger data sets, um, running these data pipelines that are in pandas. Um, and so in those use cases, it's um, it would be great to use Modin and, and supporting these uh, production use cases in Panda. So it's really focused around uh, improving that developer agility and not having to translate to a different or, or learn a different uh, technology stack to get your job done. Awesome, thanks. I think we have time for maybe one uh, or two more. Mm -hmm. um, would it be possible for Modin to support GPU parallelization now or at some point in the future? NVIDIA has the Rapids library that uses GPUs. Yeah, most of the work that we've done is on, on the CPU uh, um, acceleration front, um, but we do have, we have started looking into some uh, GPU um, sort of uh, uh, I guess, prototype um, in that front. So if you're interested, definitely like uh, send me an email and I'm happy to uh, follow up on that front. Awesome, uh, thank you very much. We have, um, maybe let's end on that kind of question about uh, potential follow-ups in the future. Uh -huh. uh, there's a question from someone in the, in the audience that says, are you hiring? Yes, uh, we are hiring uh, quite a lot at Ponder. And um, again, that's a, that's a great uh, point of follow up. If you're interested, definitely uh, shoot me an email. Awesome. I'll ask the, the final question. Um, I'll just verbalize it. Um, let's go back to Lux, the first uh, thing that you yeah. featured. And you talked about how there's different visualizations that were recommended. How do you decide which visual visualizations to recommend? Because I could imagine that some are more or less useful depending on the kind of task at hand. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I, I spent a bulk of my PhD research thinking about that question of like, there's like 10,000 different visualizations that you can create from your data. How do you, how do you figure out what data to recommend. Uh, and I, I actually did a, a bunch of research and user study over the years and, and at, during my time at Berkeley in, uh, in, in coming up with, with sort of this structured taxonomy of what are the relevant next steps uh, in, in a user's uh, or a data scientist's sort of explorations? Um, and, and what are some of these like next steps that we can recommend to them that are somewhat interesting, but also still relevant. So uh, it essentially it boils down to some mix of interestingness in the data. So that's statistical interestingness based on uh, some of the, um, the, the values and the statistics that we've computed and also what the users has expressed uh, as something that they're interested in. So let's say 
the users have the correct, oh, I'm interested in the sales column in, in a particular data set, then maybe we would want to show sales with respect to something else. And so it's a mix of those two objectives. And um, we've written some papers about this uh, in the past. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone in the audience for participating. Thank you, Doris Lee, for your time and, and, and for, um, uh, uh, for being here today. Um, next up on track stage two, uh, we have uh, Gilad Lotan. Um, uh, Gilad is the head of data science at BuzzFeed and will be talking, uh, taking us through a behind the scenes view into BuzzFeed's data operation um, and the value it provides across the products, content, and business teams. And as a reminder, as you're engaging with a talk, I encourage you to think of questions, put them in chat, and we'll get to as many of them um, toward the end. Um, without any further ado, please help me uh, and, and welcome Gilad in the uh, in the chat. Uh, hi, welcome. Um, thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, the floor is yours, thanks. Hi, hello everyone. Um, it's very, very exciting to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I was supposed to do this in person two years ago and we're doing it now. Um, so very, uh, very excited that this is happening. My name is Gilad Lotan. I lead the data science and analytics teams at BuzzFeed. Um, and my background is computer science and I've kind of been working in data for many, many, many years before kind of data science. Um, was uh, a discipline of its own. And I'm super excited to be able to talk to you all. Uh, I can't see you, but definitely drop uh, questions and we'll be looking at them. And I hope to save some time at the end uh, for Q&A. So let's get to it. Um, how analytics, machine learning, data science are transforming media. So first of all, this is the point in the talk where I would ask you all, uh, I would want to see, engage, how many of you have heard of BuzzFeed, how many of you have the app or consume content, uh, whether it's on the site, on HuffPost, on Complex, on Facebook, or Pinterest. All right, so BuzzFeed, what's unique about BuzzFeed and the, the network of properties it operates is that um, they're distributed, uh, whether on our owned and operated properties, so the dot-coms and the, the apps, and also across um, social network sites, right? So we have some of the biggest uh, TikTok accounts, some of the largest Instagram accounts. Some of them you wouldn't necessarily know are associated with BuzzFeed, right? So we have these network of properties. We produce high quality content that reaches audiences around the world, hundreds of millions of users around the world. And we really, we think deeply about the role that data plays in our operation. And that's what uh, I'd love to talk to you all about. Um, Oh, this is, you know, these are some of our biggest brands. There are a range of other brands that we operate, like Weird Helga on Instagram, uh, which is very popular, or Chicken Nugget account on TikTok. Um, but these are kind of the, the tentpole brands, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Um, over the years, we've invested massively in our tech and data stack. And um, we truly, truly believe that data gives our team superpowers. And I'll, I'll show you how uh, and sort of what we do, how we integrate data um, into our tools, into our products, into our decision-making processes. Um, but we, we've invested in uh, a range of technologies over the years that enable us to continuously collect data for every piece of content that we publish on the web. Um, and then additionally, after we obviously collect and enrich these data, we make them rely, we ensure it's reliable, accessible to teams on the inside. And increasingly we're building products, um, machine learning driven products on top of this data. Um, we believe that um, data sets give us huge digital advantages as a media company that operates only on, on the web, right? On, only online. This is our way to understand audiences, right? And it's a direct, it, it helps us build direct relationship, relationships with audiences. Um, and we'd like to think of every published event as an opportunity to learn, right? So we publish a piece of content. Um, there's some learning that we draw um, from this event, and then we iterate. Um, uh, on our hypotheses around the content, around reaching certain audiences. Um, and all this hinges on, uh, and this, this process, this kind of feedback loop is fueled by data, right? It's, it's a necessity in order to have this learning loop in place. Um, and as, this is especially important as our business becomes more complex, as the audience grows in size, 
Um, and as the, the kind of the surfaces that we operate on uh, become kind of more varied, right? We operate on our sites, on apps, on TikTok, like on all these different places, right? Um, but over the years, as we've kind of built up our services, our audiences, our product, it's very clear that the more data we pull in, the more problems that we have, right? Um, data science or analytics became, you know, as we scaled uh, our surfaces, they became a support function, right? There, this, a few years ago, there's so many questions coming at kind of anyone who knew how to work with data from across the company. Like it was really difficult to set up ETL, um, like instrumentation was inconsistent, right? There were all these data quality issues there's this, what we called analytics sprawl, right? So you have like just a range of properties which you're tracking to some degree or events you're tracking to some degree, but no consistency and reliability. Um, there wasn't kind of training in place or ex even sort of an understanding of who owns, um, who's accountable for certain quality like of data, right? So everything fell on this, data team that was not set up to be successful. So over the years, we worked on really changing the culture and investing in tooling that will enable our data team to be a lot more successful, to have specialized roles and be able to spend their time on uh, doing meaningful work that they're uniquely qualified to do. And I'd say this is something for all of you who are in school, um, as you're kind of thinking about companies uh, and talking to companies that you may want to work with or work for, it's really important to understand sort of where they're at in their maturity, right? In terms of sort of what what like what type of work? How do how do data scientists or data analysts how do they tend to spend their time, right? What do they tend to work on or focus on? Um, so as as we're sort of trying to ensure that um, you know we're building up a stable found, uh, foundation for you know our data stack and data team, uh, we found this uh, diagram uh, popularized by Monica Rigotti um, really really helpful. Where there's sort of this very clear hierarchy of needs um, in order to sort of support a mature data organization. Obviously you need to collect data first and there's a lot of instrumentation, logging, um, really sort of enrichment of data and getting data into company systems. Then there are a set of services that are really critically important around storage and movement of data, right? Making data accessible, uh, transformation of data, right? Creating certain aggregates uh, that, so that it's much, much easier to work with data sets. Um, and only once you have this stable foundation in place, you can really have kind of successful analytics, data science, machine learning operations sit on top of it. Right? So we focused on the kind of the base of this pyramid and really invested in a variety of tools that then sort of paid off uh, in, in um, you know, had incredible impact uh, downstream. Um, so I think a lot about the maturity of an organization in terms of how they um, are able to integrate data into strategy, decision making, and product development. And again, this is this is critical and really impacts the day to day work of data scientists, data analysts, and data practitioners. Uh, but if there's no sort of investment in this the this bottom of the pyramid, um, it is very difficult for a data scientist to spend time. Um, working on kind of uh, building out, iterating on models or kind of integrating machine learning capabilities into products is really, really hard to do because you end up, especially if you operate at scale, you end up uh, spending the majority of your time um, trying to understand like gotchas in data sets or whether you could trust certain data sets, right? So there's sort of all this work that has to happen uh, before you can get to the application of machine learning, for example. Um, uh, and that's one facet, one aspect of maturity, right? So it's really, really important to understand where a company is in its maturity cycle as you're kind of exploring uh, whether you, you may want to join a company or not. And what we spent over the, over the past few years, we, we spend this dedicated effort to mature our practices uh, so that our analysts and data scientists can, can work on kind of problems higher up the pyramid. Um, so one thing that we did was completely revamp our 
sort of in, homegrown instrumentation service. And um, what this is effectively, it's a, you know, it's a service that helps us understand behavior across properties, right? So this is so core to everything that we do, whether it's analytics and reporting or machine learning products, right? We need to understand behavior that's taking place on our network of sites and apps in order to um, add content rec recommender systems, in order to add personalization into, you know, in fe features across surfaces, right? We have to have a stable uh, instrumentation service in place. Um, and so the, the way that it effectively works um, is pretty straightforward. So you have Kim Kardashian, she opens up her Tasty app, right? She's trying to find a cheesecake recipe. Um, she's pointed to this page. There's an event that's sent uh, to our message bus with a client UID, right? Date, um, some other parameters. Um, you know, the source of, of the data and the, the type of event, right? As Kim browses Tasty, there are all these impression and click events uh, that are sent or swipe events that are sent um, to, and then, you know, to our message bus, they get aggregated, enriched, transformed, um, and then they land in BigQuery, which is our warehouse. Um, there are a variety of services uh, that then sort of run various aggregations and make this data accessible, right, to any uh, any consumer, whether it's through UIs, a BI tool, or directly through, you know, the, the warehouse UI or uh, via other mechanisms. Um, we, in, in sort of setting up these instrumentation processes, we realized that it's so important to have consistency in place. This is an example of a BuzzFeed page and you have to really be think hard about like, how do you want to, how, how do we categorize every event? So if a user clicks in a unit that's inside another unit uh, on this like type of page, how do we make sure we can consistently label this event so that when a data scientist or an analyst or uh, any data consumers trying to understand behaviors, they can very kind of easily uh, identify how to query or how to reach these data. So there's, uh, you know, a content hierarchy that's generalizable enough that we put in place that um, is now governs uh, like all our events across uh, sites. Uh, another step that we had to really think think a lot about and uh, put in place was transformation. So we have there's a materialized view layer, uh, which effectively creates these aggregates. Um, of our data sets, right? So we're creating um, all these pre-calculated aggregations that then are the dominant uh, data that's used uh, by data scientists and analysts. Um, I like to think of it sort of a lot of these aggregations are like, um, I like to think of it as, as sort of Marie Kondo rolling these uh, t-shirts these in nicely in drawers so we know exactly where this kind of t-shirt goes and you know how to find certain aggregations, right? And this is just an, a visual illustration of the relationships of, of tables that we had before, standardization after, right? Uh, and ultimately what um, our goal had been through this process to create a single source of truth, right? So we have data that's coming into our system, it's reliable, consistent in sort of aggregations that are very clear uh, and only one way to access kind of a data a, a data set. So we have, um, if someone on team A is looking at page views, then someone on team B who's looking at page views will get the same uh, the same data set, the same. And this is not actually a straightforward um, straightforward solution, right? Like many 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 teams and companies struggle with this uh, problem. And so BigQuery became our warehouse um, and a set of kind of services materialized views that govern and ensure we have a single source of truth. Um, so what did this give us? Um, solid foundation, bottom of the pyramid, um, ability to have reliable data at the session level, right? We're able to understand sessions uh, that happen across our properties, uh, actions that are being taken and really kind of train uh, systems to learn uh, from these events. Um, and the impact is significantly less time spent on data QA and so much more time spent on um, sort of uh, on, on 
projects and that our, our data team is uniquely qualified to perform. So such as um, we run a wide range of uh, A-B tests across uh, our sites and apps. Um, uh, you know, many of the changes that we make to our products, we want to understand the impact that they have on users, on metrics that we care about, on revenue. And so we built a homegrown uh, system to split audiences and run, um, run A-B tests, right? So we have uh, typically have multiple variants, we have control uh, user set, and then a, a range of variants, and we analyze uh, each variant gets a slightly tweaked experience and we can assess the results, whether they're statistically significant uh, at the end of a test. And this is possible because we have reliable right, event tracking data. Uh, we're able to reliably place users in buckets and understand metrics such, such as impact on revenue, for example, or impact on certain types of engagement. Um, we use A-B testing uh, across uh, for many purposes. So one is the content presentation. So how do we present a piece of content in a feed, for example, is something we would A-B test. Uh, the types of thumbnails or the types of kind of uh, split images that we may want to publish. Uh, so we test those. Um, we actually have an A-B testing uh, service that's um, directly connected to our CMS, which is used by writers to publish content. So they can test uh, a range of headlines and images and see which ones um, engender more engagement from their readers. Um, we A-B test product improvements. So if we change certain UIs or certain uh, product experiences, we, we typically test to sort of measure the, uh, the difference in, in outcome on metrics. And then there are a range of uh, revenue optimizations that we, that we can test. There are a range of algorithmic ranking systems uh, that uh, we put in place and continue to work on. So uh, almost every part of kind of the website is governed in, to some degree by algorithms. There are a few placements that are fully editorialized. Um, so like the main splash unit and there are a few other units that are curated and edit, ed, by, by our edit teams, uh, but a lot like, a lot of the surface across the site is uh, governed by algorithmic systems, whether it's um, content recommendations that seek to find um, similar items. So if, uh, you know, depending on the context of which a user is at, what, what, are, what are similar items that should be presented? Right? So we use a lot of embeddings uh, for, for that purpose, different types of embeddings. Um, we use, uh, you know, multi-arm bandit style systems to govern our feed ranking. Um, so feeds get a ton of traffic, um, and so we've deployed various multi-arm bandits there. And then a range of other recommender systems that are situational, right? So for recipes, we have a bespoke um, recommender system that, again, given the context a user is at or the search they performed, recommends uh, certain uh, items. Um, here's one example that's kind of unique for BuzzFeed, uh, BuzzFeed use, use case. So we um, publish to a wide range of pages across the internet. So on Facebook, for example, there are hundreds of pages that are sort of run by uh, BuzzFeed with I don't know, hundreds of millions of, of followers on, like, on, across these pages. And historically, like a lot of the publish, publish events uh, to these pages used to be manually curated. We built, there's a homegrown tool to publish to, to these kind of social networks, to sort of Facebook, to Twitter, to Instagram, uh, to YouTube, soon to TikTok, right? So we have a tool that is used that automates the laborious kind of um, uh, piece of work that like is, you know, social curator going to Facebook and uploading a piece of content and publishing. So we, we've kind of streamlined a lot of that work and automated. But then the next step was to start making smart recommendation and automation on where a piece of content should go, right? So we do that on our own site. And what we did here uh, was attempt to, um, you know, and not only attempt, we actually, we build out a tool that identifies, um, you know, where a piece of content should go given historical context. Um, so again, here's a classic example. We have uh, three items. Uh, all these are BuzzFeed articles. Um, certain flavors of BuzzFeed articles. So look at this adorable dog who looks like a bear. 
this chili chili dog bread rings and like, oh, this is so small okay cows too cute for words okay um so which pages should they go on to, right? Which of our range of Facebook pages? Um, so you you may, uh, one way to solve this problem could be, okay, well, we have the BuzzFeed animals page. Um, we can uh, build a bag of words classifier, um, the naive base uh, driven where we can identify each uh, sort of uh, look at each keywords, build a class of a binary classifier, which treats each word independently, right? This would be like a V000, right? The very first attempt. Um, but obviously the, the problem with this attempt, especially in this case, is that every word is treated independently, right? There's no understanding of the context of which the word dog appears in. So chili dog bread ring would be recommended to get published to BuzzFeed Animals page. And that's obviously not uh, what, what uh, we want to happen. Um, and so, you know, a few steps uh, forward, um, you know, we can leverage uh, LSTM, bi-directional networks. And uh, what's really interesting about, uh, you know, in this use case is uh, the ability to take into account the context uh, and interdependencies between like the mul multiple inputs, right? So what the network does is it evaluates the importance of the dependencies between the words and the output is a scalar that gives us a, effectively a probability. Does this piece of content belong in this page, right? So this is like one approach that we leveraged uh, to then power a system, a publishing system to identify content uh, that may get uh, published in, you know, within a page. And what's interesting is that we have historical data sets of editorial decisions, which we can use to train uh, these neural networks, right? So we have all these human editors who are taking action uh, they're, you know, they're employed by BuzzFeed. We have people who create content. We have curators who choose where to place content. And we can learn from all these historical decisions and train these models uh, on relevancy. So does this piece of content belong on, on, in this place? Uh, is this piece of content evergreen? Like, can I republish it or is it timely? Is this, you know, piece of news or uh, something that just it does not make sense to republish? Um, we can start to create run predictions on the potential performance of content and also integrate signals from our human curators, right? Because, um, you know, they, they're, they're part of BuzzFeed and it's an important function at BuzzFeed. And all these uh, take all these signals to kind of create the scheduling and routing service that then optimizes towards a wanted KPI. It could be revenue, it could be engagement, could be traffic, could be comments, right? Whatever sort of we kind of point the, the service to optimize for. Um, last use case I'm gonna talk about, uh, and then I'll, I'll open it up for questions. So definitely think, think of questions you may have. Um, we're increasingly excited by the advances uh, in, in the state of the art, especially when it comes to generative uh, models and whether it's uh, sort of generative uh, text-based or image-based models. Um, and so we're certainly uh, investing in and looking into uh, advances made by OpenAI, um, GPT-3, DALI-2, um, and really, really interested in this intersection of creativity and neural networks. Right, and so this this is one example, and we've run a number of experiments. Many of them we published uh, publicly on our site. Uh, this was, uh, I think, Valentine's Day. Um, we used, uh, in this case, we used generative uh, adversarial networks, so not any of, of, of sort of the large uh, language models. Um, and what we uh, did was uh, train a model. Uh, and use use the network to create these kind of these effectively fake accounts, right? And so the idea was, can we ask our readers to take a quiz, which they do often on BuzzFeed, answer a few questions, and then we can create their perfect uh, boyfriend or girlfriend or partner uh, using this generative adversarial network, right? And so what we did was take you know a few answers uh, from users and then generate faces of fake fake people, right? And create effectively a card, right? Like a, a dating card um, uh, for, for these folks uh, as a result. And it was a hit. It was huge, hugely successful. 
Um, and we got all these users uh, engaging and interacting uh, with a model, uh, you know, through answering our quiz questions, right? So one, um, these are all, as you can see, these profiles are all fake. They're not real people. They're created uh, by this GAN uh, that we built. Uh, Mason O, uh, Gemini, originally from Los Angeles. Uh, and then the text um, was uh, also kind of generated uh, from the model. So really want to explore the dark side of my personality with you. Um, Aiden B, I'm an avid uh, Levotic. I'm obsessed with a debate club. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, six cast iron pans. And then Cheryl, uh, originally from uh, Kennet. Um, enthusiastic guns rights activists. Enjoy uh, meditatively oiling my cutting board collection. Okay. All right, AI. Thank you for that. Um, so that's, that's an example of one way in which we think about uh, the advances in neural networks, enhancing creativity. And the cool thing about a place like BuzzFeed is that we have, first of all, teams, it's their jobs to be creative, right? They, they create content every day. Uh, and they're excited, our content teams are excited to try new new capabilities. So the challenge is always, um, okay, how do we put in place tools, um, services that they can play around with uh, these creative teams? And how do we um, really em empower their, their processes and, and have, you know, and then create these kinds of outputs uh, that we can put out in the world and have our audiences play around with. So, I'm going to I'm going to um stop here and open uh this up for questions. I hope I kind of showed you um sort of how a modern media company integrates data into uh its um processes into its product. We have a range of use cases uh whether ranging from analytics and reporting to machine learning and you know and consumer facing product building um and i would encourage you all as you as you kind of wrap up your studies as you talk to companies you may want to uh, work for really really engage and, and think about sort of the maturity the comp the company and the teams are at and whether the role that you're being offered, um, the time you spend in the role is, you know, you would be doing the type of work you want to be doing. Um, so I'm going to pause here and awesome. take some questions. Thanks, Gilad. Let's uh, first zoom out before we zoom back in. So I'm wondering um, kind of where on this pyramid of needs do you see defined the data? And you're welcome to interpret that however you want. But the way I think about it is broadly, how do you know what data is important to your organization? Where in the pyramid of needs um, uh, define the data? I see. Um, so it's it's actually not an easy question to answer. Um, it depends on uh, the the main problem space the company operates in. Depends on the bu the business lines. Depends on the executive team, right? What they care about. So it may be um, you know. You, could typically say that revenue data is critically important, but actually for a growth focused company, engagement um, and sort of understanding of retention or attrition is really, really important, many times more important than revenue. So it depends on, it really depends on the company. I don't have a great answer. I would say for BuzzFeed, we deeply care about um, revenue. So we want to create sustainable media services and flywheels, right? So we're the cost of content creation, um, we have to kind of, we're very much in tune with with the revenue that comes back from content. We integrate that into our decision making. Uh, but I'd say also very much look at engagement. So both re revenue and user engagement, which comes in many forms of metrics. Awesome. Thank you. Next up, we have a question by uh, Donald. Can you talk about software engineering in the data science context? For example, code reuse, code review, testing, production push, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah, it's a great question. I'd say every data, data science roles and teams are set up very differently uh, across companies. For BuzzFeed, data scientists are predominantly sort of grads of the type of programs that um, Berkeley has. Um, so they work on early prototyping, they work on proof of concepts, they productionize, uh, but work, you know, through the process of productionizing uh, models or machine learning based products. 
they uh, work in tandem with our um, ML kind of infra engineers. And so I would say um, there could be, you know, data scientists who are more full stack in terms of engineering, but typically what I see are data scientists working collaboratively with uh, sort of infra or ML, ML pipeline engineers. Um, and it, it again, it depends on the maturity of a company, if they're kind of um, mature um, services or kind of pipelines in place. As a data scientist, you could pretty much do everything and kind of iterate on a model, um, run an A-B test, measure the results. But for the majority of companies, you would need to collaborate with a software engineer who is, um, you know, has is experience on the infra side. Awesome, thanks. And our final question will be about A-B testing. Uh, what kind of tool stacks or platforms do you use and about how many A-B tests do you do on a daily or monthly basis? Yeah, we have a homegrown uh, tool that we built that splits uh, audiences. Um, we actually um, built a set of reporting on top of Google Colab um, because it's you know pretty easy to use. Um, so we have a homegrown system that kind of splits audiences, um, identifies you know uh, uh, buckets users into into experiment groups, and can run multiple experiments in parallel. And then a set of um, kind of an analysis tools, right, to create reports and and kind of understand uh, the outcomes. We currently, how many tests do we run? Um, I don't know, maybe thirty in a month, twenty to thirty. But I'd say something that I think I think about a lot is like the quantity of how many tests do we run want to run. And to some degree, like I'm a big believer in like not running many tests, and there there are certain features that we should just launch without running tests on, right? Because there's a huge kind of toll and tax in terms of time spent and analyzing and kind of looking at test results. So I'd say you really have to hit a a, a good um, balance. You don't want to run too many tests, I think, but you obviously want to run enough tests to make smart decisions. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Gilad. Thank you for being here today, for sharing your insight. We appreciate your time. Um, and I want to zoom out and, and thank everyone uh, for joining us in this year's Data Edge event. Really excited that you chose to share your time with us on this track too. Um, and we can't wait to see you uh, next time. Thank you very much.